Welcome to another edition of Inside Guyana. Today, on our program, we have a special guest, a special Guyanese personality, a very prominent individual, a unique individual, I should say. I was taking time off to come from Toronto, Canada, to New York City, and has uh, been courteous in offering us this opportunity to listen to some of his views on some very important topics uh, which actually affect uh, Guyana, Guyanese and people all over the world. When I say all over the world, you're going to understand uh, that uh, phrase during the interview. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to our program inside Guyana. On behalf of the management and staff and our cameraman led by Mr. Ravi and Prakash, our director, and producer here today uh, to welcome is Dr. Andrew J. Ramcharan. Sir, welcome to the program Inside Guyana. It's a pleasure having you, sir. Thank you very much, Rudy, for having me here. It's indeed an honor and privilege for, to be here and for your kind invite. I really appreciate it to be here. And let me uh, tell our viewers a little bit about Dr. Andrew Ramcharan, as far as I understand from the little research. I've done very little research on you, Dr. Ramcharan. And I understand you have a PhD, Doctor of Philosophy in Mining Engineering, which is very impressive. And you did some studies in mineral processing. And you also have a, li you're a licensed professional engineer uh, in Ontario, uh, Canada. And you also, uh, you are a fellow of the Australian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy. And you're also a registered member of the Society of Mining and Metallurgical Engineering in the United States of America. So from Australia, you go to Canada and the United States, uh, you've been around the world it seems. Uh, you studied at the Colorado School of Mining and then you also attended Harvard uh, Business uh, School. Uh, what did you not do, sir? <laughs> That's a very interesting question, Rudy. So, before I, we start, before we start, we let us give you the opportunity uh, without me interfering into your uh, answers. So, please tell our viewers a little bit about yourself, your background, where were you born, which part of Guyana you're from, who are your parents, what kind of work are they involved in, if you want to say that, your brothers, sisters, if you have any. Uh, family members and your school and your studies probably before you migrated to the uh, United States or Canada, before you left Guyana. <laughs> okay, so yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I uh, was born in um, West Coast, Anna Katrina, and I'm one of four, uh, five children to my parents. And they quickly moved to St. Stanislaus College because of, you know, the bridge was right there and the, uh, the boat, you actually you used to take the boat and go across. So we went, eventually all went to Saints. And uh, so when you say Saints, what do you mean? St. Stanislaus College, okay. high school. Because there are many Saints in Guyana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, St. Stanislaus. So, you know, we, we have a pretty good reputation as being Saint students and work with alumni. And, um, there's just a recent concluded um, Saints reunion in Georgetown, I think it was an like Easter weekend. And then I started at um, University of Guyana. I started in mining engineering a long time ago. I guess, you know, that's a very long time ago. And after graduating in mining, I started working in, um, in Guyana, the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission. But then I realized that, you know, in the global world, you have to be very competitive. And then I went uh, to university again. I went and started computer science. Which university? The university of Guyana. Okay. So while I was working, I started um, computer science. And then I did a, just a two-year diploma. And then I started accounts because I wanted a wide spectrum to understand the whole industry before moving to Canada. And this was like about 18 years ago. And what happened, it's, you know, things from there on was just, you know, spiral. And because there's, you know, there's so many opportunities here and there's so many opportunities outside in the world. And, you know, these are some of the key things to understand is that there's so many opportunities. 
and it's easier to step down than to step up. What year did you leave Guyana? 1998. Okay. So it's, it, it has been a while back, but I moved to Canada. But then I moved back to the United States. I moved to the United States in 2003. I lived there for like six years. I was based in Australia for a bit. I was based in West Africa for a bit because I'm in... That's after the United States? It's in between. Okay. So then I moved back to Canada in 2009. So I've, you know, been around a bit. Okay. So that's as far as your study. So what is your specific area of studies? I mean, mining engineering is, is, is wide. Can you tell us a little bit more your area of specialization? Okay, so I'll start from the beginning. So I started in, in Canada working as an uh, engineer, which is the beginning level, and quickly realized that the mining industry, there's, it's a massive industry and there's a lot of different areas. And I wanted to touch on most of the areas and get a feel for the complete industry because fundamentally I wanted to move on top of the industry. And in those days, to penet penetrate the working mining industry, it had to be extremely, extremely competitive and hard to get into jobs and school and stuff like that. So it was a challenge initially getting in, involved. And this, you know, leads back to a lot of the younger people. It's very competitive and you have to be outstanding and you have to, you know, above and beyond because if you're going to be the regular person it, to penetrate markets and industry that, you know, is uh, pretty much dominated previously by other um, working class people and stuff. It could be a challenge. So th this is one of the key things. So after starting the mining, I went on into um, as an investment banker in the U.S. So we had a private equity fund, and you know I travel around the world looking at um, natural resources projects for investments, different investment vehicle, different investment strategies. And this included like travels to like Armenia, Australia, and all over the world. And you I know, understand you travel to uh, more than 100 countries, is that correct? Yeah, I've, I've been just over, over 100 countries to the last, I recall. Wow, I so you've been con collecting gold from all these countries <laughs> or what? I wish. In fact, I don't have any gold. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you probably sold all of them, <laughs> and you're a rich man by now. No, I'm rich at heart. No gold. <laughs> you find the people who are in the industry don't normally have these things. You know, they, you, know you remember like um, the guys who are big into gold and diamond, they're normally the ones without the gold <laughs> and the diamond. So after investment banking, I um, went into consultancy, and this is in the United States. And I work on so many different commodities, molybdenum, uranium, gold, copper, silver. I worked in the Middle East. When you say you work, mm -hmm. what specifically uh, does your work entail? Would you be kind enough to elaborate a little bit for the, for the uh, benefit of our viewers? Sure. So it varied. As a banker, when you say you work on a project, it means that you run the due diligence on the company which includes management, include the legal aspect, technical aspect, financial aspect, business um, aspects, and then determine and establish whether or not this is a good investment um, proposition. You create investments, papers, and stuff like that. You propose, in, as compared to like in consultancy now, you would work with companies and prepare like financial models, you know, prepare technical reports for the stock exchange, help them on raising funds, help them on, you know, getting to the market, doing IPOs. In fact, I worked with um, SUIC, which is a large Russian coal mining company, and helped them IPO in, on, in London AIM in the mid 2000s. And after, in consultancy, I moved back to Toronto, I think 2009, with IM Gold, uh, doing mergers and acquisitions. And, you know, I worked on some of the major deals in the mining industry globally. So I worked on the, the Valley Extrato takeover in 2006, 2007. Um, I think that was a fifth day. It, it was a, one of the largest deal in the history of the mining industry. And after mergers and acquisitions, 
I tend to like this area and I focus mainly on mergers and acquisition, but merger and acquisition entails a lot of technical, financial, and business aspects. So this gives you a wide spectrum of the mining industry. And you know, I'm currently based in Toronto, and I'm working with a mining company. Uh, I consult with a few other companies, and I lecture part-time in the University of Toronto in um, resource and reserve estimation. Wow, so you do, you're a very uh, versatile personality, I should say. Do you dance and sing as well? I do. I, I, I can dance after a few, uh, after a few good wines, you know, red wine, uh, I, I dance. <laughs> you went into business, you went into gold, you went into all these different uh, precious metals and, um, you know, fantastic. You're probably a good role model for the Guyanese uh, uh, people in general. Uh, I think, um, you know, I, I would put it more like, you know, there's opportunity there and let, let you know, that people can focus and see the world as a global village and realize that, you know, each country is just a subset of a global village and not to be in isolation and work together and realize that, you know, it's, it, it, it's a global village. With communication these days, you know, everything comes to your fingertip. And let's not try to, you know, work independently or recreate the wheel, as they would say. Right. And there's so much, you know, we can learn from Canada, yeah, absolutely. Chile. Absolutely. There's so much we can learn from you. Uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, uh, let's say, your, well, you mentioned your relationship with the gold mining companies and your role, your contribution. Did you make any contribution to the gold mining industry? Uh, thank you very kindly, yeah. So, yeah. You know, for the latter part of my career, I've been focusing more on the gold and the copper and silvers side of the business. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very well connected in the mining industry. I'm, I'm very well known because, you know, I helped on um, combining all the codes like 43101, Jork, uh, Samrick, and come together and try to create one global codes where countries from all over the world could um, report and establish, uh, you know, an international set of standards and rules for, for investors. Because we, we, we're trying to avoid another BREEX. You know, in BREEX... In, what what is BREEX? BREEX is one of the largest gold scam that happened in Canada that, you know, where investors ripped um, a lot of investors off over $5 billion. And what they did, they took core samples and then it put, um, in simple terms, put gold inside the samples and we're, we're reporting high, high grades. Mm -hmm. And this is a massive story. And basically- That's fraud. It is fraud. It's big time. And that's when Ford 311 came about, which is a reporting standard for the Ontario Security Commission, which is on the stock exchange there. So that investors cannot, you know, get fraud that easily. So they created these standards so that all comp publicly traded company has to report. So this happens around the world, like Russia, China, um, Australia, South Africa, Guyana, Chile. No, no I don't. I, <laughs> I don't think they have any codes. Oh, they don't have any. No. So you know, then I combine all of these, and you know, instead of having different um, set of codes, I try to standardize it and bring up an international set of codes. So. So your it, contribution is in that area. It's that area, and then um, I'm pushing towards. Um, you know, there is, I don't know if you, you read that, you know, in Canada um, last week or the week before, one of the federal minister is pushing for uh, clamping down on uh, Canadian companies and foreign companies working in third world countries or underdeveloped countries to ensure that they're aligned and, you know, make all the human rights aspect, environmental aspects and stuff like that. So I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat involved in the political arena in, in Canada. So I'm trying to get involved there and, you know, see how we can set up a set of global rules that, you know, all companies should be aligned. And more importantly, that, you know, they're being followed and regulated from the country. So do they have some international convention and international laws regulating the activities and manner in which uh, the gold mining industries and companies function? They are. They're like on the environmental side, the World Bank has the equator principle 
So this is an international set of principles that the World Bank established. And what happens before you go, these are capital intensive projects, before you go out to raise capital for any mining um, project or to build a mine, you have to ensure that you align and prepare documents that are aligned to the equator's principle before you can get capital. But the trick is, this is just preparing reports and following these. But what happened on the ground sometimes can be different. Like so, what? So like, for example, you, you would prepare an EIA, Environmental Impact Assessment, Impact Statement, and you submit it. It looks all good, handy, and dandy, and you're gonna raise the capital. Some the projects are very capital intensive. Yes. Like the Cobra Panama project in um, Panama is five billion dollars. You know, we built the mine in um, Burkina Faso. It was over when you say we, what do you mean? Um, when I was in I'm Gold, we bought um, <coughs> Ore Zone, which is in Burkina Faso, and we put it into production. It was over $250 million there, capital. And that was one of the smaller projects there. So before you can raise capital to build these mines, you have to ensure that you have all your EIA and EIS up to standards and you know human rights and stuff like that. But when you go on the ground, sometimes things are different. They would just say these here, but you know, like how Canadians operate is going to be different from how some other country is going to operate in a different country. You know, we we would tend to have higher standards and ensure that you know we look at human rights, we ensure that the environment is intact, and you know, try to do more. And these things are all relative to each other. So it's not necessarily the best, but it's relative to the other. It's, it's really good. So you can imagine what happens with other companies. Are you involved in any kind of a scam or companies that are involved in scams? Mm -hmm. No, you not to my, uh, No, I'm not involved in any scam. I'm a licensed <coughs> professional. So I'm liable under law in Canada for anywhere I, I travel. So if I'm traveling anywhere, it's... <coughs> No, so I'm not involved in any scam. How about you? <laughs> no, I, I've never been involved in any kind of <coughs> gold mining scams or any kind of scams. I'm very honest and sincere in whatever I do. Okay. And uh, that's why I'm on television. I don't have anything to hide. Okay. And that's why I can ask some very serious questions without worrying whether they, people are going to ask me the same questions. Because the questions I ask, are very, very uh, important for our viewers to become more enlightened about whatever our guests, uh, you know, might be involved in. So I think today is a very good opportunity, and we want to thank you for that, uh, for enlightening our viewers in this uh, very unique and special and important aspect. As you know, Guyana has a lot of uh, gold uh, uh, resources, and we need to utilize the resources of Guyana not only in gold, but today we're talking about gold mining and other minerals that are available in Guyana in large quantities or commercial quantities. And with your help and your suggestions, probably some ideas might be uh, like uh, available here today and might prompt other ideas from government officials or technical people and help you know, the process of Guyana's economic development. This is all what our program Inside Guyana is all about, bringing out ideas from uh, people who have experience and expertise in various areas that uh, might be able to, to move Guyana forward or help people to get more ideas from your ideas or develop your ideas. So uh, tell us a little bit about your most interesting uh, discovery in your profession uh, and your relationship with uh, gold mining companies and other companies generally. You don't have to be too uh, detailed because our interview is uh, not too long. So I know you have a lot to say, but try to be as brief as possible. And your, your personal thing, because we want to focus on you, you're a Guyanese and we're very proud of uh, Mm, I don't want to say important only, but uh, qualified intellectuals of Guyanese origin. And you happen to have convinced the world, if you have traveled to more than 100 countries, that you are such a person. Would you be kind enough to please tell our viewers about your most interesting uh, discovery while working for these gold mining companies, some ideas that you might have and you know, want to share? Sure. Thank you very much. So you touched on some very good points here. Um, so some of the important things that I, I think is that 
Ghana is very well known around the world in the mining community because of the Omai and the Ghana gold fields and the Troy resource, these large scale mining. But more importantly, you know, and this is the bigger picture, as you would realize, and more the very big picture, and I see things very globally. It's when the continents were together, Ghana has, and Ghana on the Shanti belt, where they mine over 50 million ounces of gold, is on the same uh, geological trend. Ghana in West Africa. In West Africa. Okay, when the Ghana, continents, okay. right. When the continents were together. That's for our viewers, yes. Right. When the continents were together, the, there's a massive geological structure and it flows over from there and it has the same geology in Guyana, Suriname and Venezuela. And in the, on the Ashanti belt, they had mined over 50 million ounces of gold. I actually walked the Ashanti belt and you see gold all over the In Ghana. In Ghana, in West Africa. And this trend is in Guyana. And so it's very well known and very well established globally that Guyana is one of the few untouched very, very rich mineral resource country in the world. And the potential to, the, if, if, with the proper development and regulation of the mining industry in Guyana, it can become a, one of the wealthiest per capita country in the world. And the thing is, we talk about gold all the time. Guyana has much more than gold. Guyana has things like uranium, rare earth metal, as you know, bauxite, gold, diamond, sand, quarry. But the key thing is that it is known that Guyana is very underdeveloped in terms of the natural resources industry. And it's not to the Canadian standards or you know, one of the higher standards. So there's room there to advance the industry, which can create very high paying jobs. Okay, maybe we can get a job there very soon. <laughs> Why don't you uh, Canadians uh, go there and uh, help us to, to develop the Guyana? Uh, resources? I think um, there are a few Canadian companies there. I did a research on it. There, there, are, pre there are quite a few um, publicly traded companies in Guyana. But I think um, w what has to happen is that they have to be proactive and you know, want it to happen. And you have to be you know, promoting the industry because people know it. Sometimes people know more about you than you think you know about yourself because it's so well established. Can inspire it's you, is that correct? Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's, it's well-known technical and geological facts that Guyana is very wealthy in natural resources. And, you know, this is one industry that's lagging behind and potentially can be one of the most viable economic driver for the country and the people. Dr. Andrew Ramcharan, we are very uh, happy to have you in our studio today. And I know you're, you're a Guyanese uh, uh, at heart. You recently went to Guyana, and you visited Guyana quite often in the few, last few years, I understand. Is that so? Yeah, I, I, visit, I visit Guyana, and I visit quite a few places quite often because, you know... I'm wondering, um, since you've been going to Guyana, and uh, you probably love Guyana, is that so? Yeah, I do. I like, okay. and you I like Guyana. I like, you know, most places. I live in Canada, too, mm -hmm. and, you know, I live around, so I do like quite a few places. Okay. I, now that we have established that, uh, that uh, love for Guyana, and then you have all these expertise in the resources, which you yourself mentioned that Guyana has in abundance, uh, especially in your area of profession, uh, the gold resources, gold mining resources, the reserves in Guyana. I want to ask you, sir, uh, how uh, could you use your skills and your talent, your expertise and your vast experience uh, to advise the Guyana government, the professionals in Guyana, the technical people, and uh, everyone in Guyana who is uh, affiliated or associated with Guyana's economic development, how would you use your skills to advise them to improve the situation? Let's use moderate terms here, to improve the economic situation. As you know, the people in Guyana, despite their vast resources, they're still living in a situation or conditions of, of uh, poverty. Yeah. And maybe the economic development with your input or your influence or your advice might help them to alleviate uh, poverty in Guyana. How would you use your skills? Is there uh, anything that you can do or you can help or you can advise the Guyana people to 
Yeah. That's a very loaded question there, Rudy. <laughs> yeah, but my questions, my questions are sin sin my questions are sincere, Doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you to, in a yeah, very, yeah. In, a, in, a, in our interview, to give the, uh, the Guyanese people, all the viewers of this uh, program, at least uh, real good advice. Sure. So, you know, like, there, there's two aspects to, to this question here. So we can talk about the large scale and the small scale. Where the large scale is basically all the foreign companies that are operating in Ghana, like the Ghana Goldfields and you know the Troy and stuff. And then we can talk about the small scale miners, the guy who is doing alluvial mining. You know, on 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 the small scale side, I think we have to take more a scientific approach and you know, drill before you mine, get the administration and the technical people to assist the, the local miners, because they invest heavily into uh, mining here in, in Guyana. But it has to be done in a scientific manner. You have to drill a little before, and this can be done in different ways. Obviously, people are gonna come up and ask where you're gonna get the money from. So what is important is that maybe that the government help do some drilling before they auction out the claims and give out the land for mining. You know, another key thing is that the technical people in Ghana, they're very, very good. But it's just the exposure to the industry is not there. So how things are done there is not necessarily how it could be done in a more efficient manner. So, you know, I can assist, you know, in bringing a lot of these skill set. I, you know, I lecture part-time at the University of Toronto. I can work together with the universities and bring them together. I have a, a lot of access to investors, but investors want to see, you know, substantial material before they invest, because obviously they're investing people's money. So you have to convince the investment community that, you know, this is something of value. You can't just come and say, I have a claim. I, I think it has 10 million ounces. I need $100 million for it. But you have to create documents. You have to prepare things. And sometimes these things don't cost a lot. So what I think should be like, you know, uh, going forward is that the administration recognizes that this is one of the most on top um, area that can develop Ghana in a very, very short time and create high paying jobs. Look at the petroleum industry, look at the mining. These things, you just consider these two industries, it will make all Guyanese very wealthy if, you know, if, if properly managed and regulated. So, you know, I can get investors to come there. I can get, you know, meet set up meetings with investors. You know, I have the educational part where I can get university students. I can help on um, so many different aspects in um, the industry. But I think, you know, what, what one of the key thing is that we have to recognize that a mining industry, it's a global village and everybody knows each other. So you have to be prepared to work at the international level. If you work in isolation, and you and you know expect to be like the big Canadian companies and stuff like that. It's going to be tough. So going forward, I would you know like to you know contribute in a way that to to bridge the gap and you know and understand that you know it's lagging. But you know th there's scope and there's room. It's just the exposure we have to introduce there. Um, you mentioned just now there's a gap and so on. Uh, can you be a little bit more specific on that? Yeah. Are so there legislations in place? Uh, are, are regulatory uh, mechanisms in place? Or uh, something I'm missing there? So there, there, there's, a, there's a mining act and the mining regulations there. But, you know... Is it adequate? Are those adequate? When it was developed, it, at the time it was developed, at the time it was there. But you have to remember the mining industry now in Ghana is kicking off. And there's more and more companies coming there. I don't know if you know, they did a flyover, which did, which I suppose to map all the resources. Who, who they? I, I kind of, it was a couple of years ago, I read something like that, I think it was the Iranians or, I, I'm not sure, but they did a flyover, which basically supposed to map the resources of the country. Now, when it was developed, yeah, it was more of a bauxite gold mining company and maybe some diamonds. But now they're moving to things like copper, uranium, rare ores, and stuff like that. So the Mining Act and the Mining Regulations, just like in any other country or any other part of the world, has to move in line with the development of the industry. 
So every country or every industry normally will develop as a function of their development of that specific industry. So there is time now, there's room there. We, you know, we should be considering um, updating the, you know, the Mining Act and the regulations, if they're not. I, I don't know if they are, are or not, but as of the latest, you know, it doesn't cater for different commodity. And you know, with petroleum coming on stream, which is another whole story I can talk about because you know, just one of the area, you know, Colorado School of Mines is very familiar. Um, you know, one of the top schools in the world to go to for petroleum engineering. And, you know, these are, you know, areas where we should start preparing our young people and, you know, technical people to be from now to get into these petroleum engineering and understand the industry too. And obviously not mining. I'm sure you're aware that Guyana is one of the uh, first countries in South America with railway lines and all of that. So the first railway line in South America was built in Guyana uh -huh. uh, for the mag manganese, um, manganese company. Yes, this is a South African base, yes, a long yeah. time ago. That's according to my research in uh, international economic relations. So oh, wow. it's something that you can look into. So transportation uh, is very important in Guyana and in any um, area where you're seeking to develop the economy. Yeah, for sure. There, there's a manganese company right now in Guyana and it was going to go into production. I think it's close to production and they had some issues. But like you said, that's one thing lacking in the mining, the infrastructure. Infrastructure like power, you know, like one time when I was with IM Gold, because um, IM Gold owned Cambiar and Cambiar owned Omai. And, you know, power was a, um, power cost was a main driver. It was very, it was one of the highest um, aspect of Factor. our total operating Factor. costs. So we looked at alternatives of, um, you know, reducing uh, operating costs by looking at alternatives to power. And, you know, there's not much infrastructure the, uh, because the Ghana is so large. Dr. Andrew Ramcharan, very interesting interview. I'm sure our, our business people, our business-minded people, who are probably uh, holding lots of gold mining concessions in Guyana, including government officials who have gold mining um, concessions, uh, might be interested to hear from you uh, what you can do uh, how can you influence uh, the Guyanese uh, gold mining business people to better give them exposure to the international arena? Is that something you can help with? Uh, you know, the technical people in Guyana might want to know a little bit more about you, you know, what you can offer them. Can you make some kind of arrangement to share your knowledge or sh uh, give them opportunities to come and visit? Uh, some of the mines that you have relationship with? Is oh that yeah, that's, that's very good, um, Dr. Rudy. You know, it's for sure. I think one of the key things is for us to realize that the mining industry is very global. And let's not look locally, but see ourselves as part of the global picture. And once we recognize that, you know, it, it's an international industry and we don't settle for, for, for very little, instead of looking at a bigger picture, I think that's one of the drivers. And I'm always happy to help anywhere I can, you know. That's why when the University of Toronto called me and asked me if I would be, um, if I can assist in lecturing, I'm like, sure. Because I reach a phase now that, you know, it's time to give back. And, you know, now it's the time where, you know, I'm very happy to share any, with anyone, anywhere, in any part of the world. And I really like to see when, you know, people understand that the industry is so global and you be part of the global thing and you can move up there. It's, it's not difficult, but you just have to take the right steps and, you know, advance. But look, the key is to ensure that you're seeing the bigger picture always. And you're, 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 you're a small part of the big pie, but you have to understand how the big pie works. You know, the whole engine works, not just one part. And then you can have more of a, you know, significant in input in the whole bigger picture. So I would be very happy um, anywhere, any part, and I'll be happy to assist anyone, not only in Vienna, but any part of the world. Because I know you're a, a man of the global village too, from Moscow to Toronto, New York, and Europe, and Eastern Europe. 
So New York too, because I know there's a lot of big investors in New York and a lot of big funds are moving towards the natural resources because they believe that the prices are going to pick up very soon on gold, what's happening with the Panama Papers and ISIS and stuff. People are moving away from the dollar and heading into gold for stability. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to assist in anywhere I can. And you can assist, is that correct? Yeah, I could. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm very well connected in the industry. So how should people contact you? We're going to put up your email address or your telephone numbers or, or just do a facial recognition on the internet to identify you? I'm going to let you set, it, set up the... Um, because You want him to come through me? No, <laughs> okay. I, I'm a man of your cow because, you know, I, I'm honored. You, you invited me here. You sent it a very you know, special invite and I feel very honored here because, you know, I give speeches around the world and talk about mining. I think you saw the one in, in Switzerland. Yes, I did. I Switzerland, did. in Toronto. And, you know, I just want to promote and assist in any way I can. And, you know, so if they can contact you, I would be happy to, you know, assist in any way I can. You know, investors, I think those are the, I can have access to investors with people with lots of money that would be willing to happy and happy to invest in mining. But you just have to ensure that you're very prepared and that, you know, that you, you, don't, you don't come with a piece of paper and just expect people to throw money at you. Right. Dr. Ramcharan, uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, and I took notice of that, what you mentioned. You said you were involved in some uh, takeover. I understand from the research I did that you're involved in actually three major uh, world uh, takeovers in Canada and in West Africa. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit? Is this something you can sure. share with us? So then I move from the technical to financial and business. I do mergers and acquisition. That's one of my specialty. So I've looked at over for investments, whether it's a merger, acquisition, or reverse takeover. I looked at over 200 gold projects around the world and over 400 projects generally around the world. And you know, one, so when I did these uh, takeovers, this is what, that's what executed. But we were closer to doing much more than those. But it's just that, you know, when we take it to the board or to the investment committee, it did not advance. So the, late, the last one I did, it was in 2012. I led a team and we did a takeover for $609 million in Canada, like you rightfully said. It was, um, advanced exploration project with over 5 million ounces of gold in Canada. In 2009, we closed the Essacan deal, which is in Burkina Faso, um, and that's over $200 million takeover. And so we basically took the company over and advanced the project to production. So the one in Burkina Faso, I was there a few times, um, is in production. It produces over 350,000 ounces of gold per year. The one in um, the U.S. in Canada, they're advancing, and we did. I did some um, private placements in Latin and South America, and I looked at a <coughs> massive deal in Brazil with um, Vale Extrato. So it's interesting, you know, yes. because you get to touch on all aspects: the legal side the financial side, the business, you know, because the business side is, is, you know, strategy. I'll come to you and I tell you I want to take your company out. And there's different ways. It can be a friendly takeover. It can be a hostile takeover. Because I did hostile takeover too and friendly. A reverse takeover. And then you negotiate, you know, the premiums on top of your share price and stuff like that, which I'm sure you're familiar. Yes. So those are very high-level negotiation, you know. So you're a lecturer? Also, currently at uh, Toronto, uh, was it University? University of Toronto. University of Toronto. Have you written any books or articles or academic papers in that, uh, you know, in that profession? In yeah, that I did. Um, I did on um, mineral resource and reserves, and I did some on um, mineral economics. So, no, what you said, I did some. What is exactly? That you did. I wrote papers, I wrote papers. on uh, res mineral resource and reserves. How, well, what know, is the exact title of your oh, papers? I can't remember. There are quite a few of okay. those. Oh, when you get to my age, you, you, you don't remember these <laughs> <You're> that, yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> You're not that old. You're still a young man and have a lot of energy and, and um, you know, experience here that you can share. 
the gold prices uh, seem to be fluctuating as recently. I remember uh, in the 80s it was very low, like $18 dollars an ounce, and now it's like uh, thousands of dollars. Uh, it was like almost $2,000, $1,800, then it's now $1,200 approximately. Uh, what is your, I mean, just say, you don't have to be exact, but what is your, giving your level of expertise in that uh, industry, in the gold mining industry in particular? How do you see the gold prices, uh, let's say, in the next uh, couple of years, probably next one, two, three, four, five, ten, twenty years? Sure. So that's a very good question and you know you always get this question and the, the normal answer on Bay Street in Toronto is that if you could predict gold price more than like you'd be retired. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just to answer you know what I find a lot of the stable economies of the world like the Australia, the Canada, some of the European country and stuff are natural resource driven economies. A lot of their uh, revenues are generated from natural resources. And what you find that natural resources, oil, and some other global you know, events actually is some of the drivers of gold price. And what's been happening lately, there has been a boom a couple of years ago in the development of China. And that was driving commodity price and I think there's another boom is coming because with India over a couple billion of people there's a middle class that needs to develop sooner or later and what's going to happen is that because the United States has so much debt and China controls their debt and China does not control natural resources they they're trying to to you know, get their, their feet out into natural resources like West Africa, South America, Latin America, and North America, and control the natural resources industry with the debt money. So, so what's going to happen, I think, in the very, very near future, the, there's going to be another rally of, of our commodity price. And we have to be prepared, because if gold prices are going up, copper prices are going up, silver prices are going up, uranium prices are going up, and with, with the event of the Panama Papers, the ISIS and stuff, a lot of people and investors are scared to be in, in, with the dollar. So they're moving towards gold. So I, and, and, you know, I think it's going to move. Gold was existing, was the, was the standard in up to 1975. You know that, right? Yeah, I do. Okay, so we're going back. You rec recommended that we go back to the gold standard? I think the dollar is going to be there, but it's going to drift more from the dollar into the stability of gold. And that's going to drive the price up. And what's going on with the Panama Papers? I think what's going on with the Panama Papers is going to actually be bigger than we think it's going to happen. And it's going to expose a lot of things. And, and it could potentially drive gold price up uh, significantly. But a key thing is to be prepared whether or not it's going to move. And you have to ensure that your economics, when you're doing your economics, is to look at it at the base low price. And then what if it goes up? A sensitivity analysis and take it as bonus. Because... You know, if it comes to another boom, like where gold was $1,800 and you're not prepared, you start buying equipment and, you know, spreading yourself thin again, you might end up back in, in the same situation. So I'm, I'm bullish on commodity price, very bullish. Oh, that's very good. So you don't know the exact, um, like, uh, you didn't call any numbers there. You're talking like a politician. <laughs> I want you to talk as a... As a person with expertise in the gold mining business industry, I um no, I, I wish I can tell you numbers, but I'm, I'm bullish. I'm, I'm very bullish because I trade too, and I've been you know. So you think the price is going to go up? Yes. Because of the increase in demand, which might be triggered uh, because uh, you're uh, forecasting or you envisage a uh, switch from the dollar to the gold standard. No, not not a switch as such. I think there's going to be a higher demand, like I'm saying, because they, there's such a, a massive uh, population in Asia that moves to, needs to move to the middle class that I think it's going to move towards um, you know, the, the things like iron ore, copper, silver, and all these things. It's going to drive these prices, like what happened five years ago. Um, the demand, I'm pretty sure the demand, because there's a lot of emerging economies that are, are heading out there. So, you know... 
for sure they're gonna be developing so, so people are getting richer and richer and as they get richer they want to acquire more gold and and save the gold up for no, I, I, future generations of yeah this. so what, I, what i'm talking about more is you know there's base and precious metal so the, what i'm talking about more is the copper and the silver and those stuff with gold now gold is more driven by you know the, your, your safety a safe haven where to where, where to keep your you know, investors into the money and stuff like that and these are driven by things like uh, global uncertainties like wars and you know a lot of um, different global activities it's not so much of a high demand supply thing but it's more of a trigger of global events like for example the US dollar the you know people recognizing more and more US politics what if this person gets into politics what if this becomes a president how it can affect the stability of the dollar versus gold so people would move to gold to eliminate or de-risk their investments what happens if there's a massive war what happens if X becomes president of America you know okay let's talk politics <laughs> because you're not answering the question <laughs> as I expected anyway <laughs> You, you reserve that right uh, uh, not to give numbers. Uh, you mentioned also earlier that you have some connections with the Canadian politicians. Uh, Justin Trudeau, I saw you on Facebook uh, with a photograph with Justin uh, Trudeau, the current uh, Prime Minister in Canada. Uh, how involved are you uh, with the Canadian politicians, the top guys? And if your relationship is so good with them, how can you utilize that relationship to, let's say, benefit the diaspora, the Guyanese diaspora, uh, so that they can be more involved and aware of what is taking place in international political arena? Yeah, so um, I'm part of the Liberals. I'm proud to say that in Canada. I'm an executive of one of downtown major riding, one of the hard riding in Toronto, and I actively uh, assisted in the um, elections. And as you know, the Prime Minister of Canada was elected last year. We met a few times, yeah, and I met a few of the federal ministers and MPs and stuff like that. And you know, the key thing is that in the political arena, what, what I really admire is that you know, as you see. Um, the Prime Minister is very young, he's very energetic and I believe that you know these younger folks with you know with with all the right attributes you know they genuinely want to assist and advance the country. You know and Canada is one of the leading countries in the world on many aspects. It's nice to see when younger people and you know the cabinet if you look at a cabinet and you know all the, the parliamentarians and stuff like that it's very diverse, so we're mo we're drifting from a you know a stereotype of parliament, and now we have people from all aspects of life. They are young, very young people, and all different aspects. So you know the political you know arena around the world is is moving. Just like like I said earlier, you know as thing, things evolve, you have to evolve with with you the know times. the development. And if you if you if you plan to stay back you're gonna have a gap there to connect with and you know the young people should be given an opportunity and you know to take the little the mantle of leadership going forward and you have been involved in Guyana politics also you've been uh, uh, there uh, you know from earlier uh, situations and you've probably met with some of the Guyanese uh, politicians you don't have to uh, to acknowledge or deny that but my question to you is that how can you uh, help Guyana more you have done a lot you mentioned a lot you're willing to do that and you elaborated on some of the measures that you envisage that can help Guyana I want to ask you if you can be specific let's say if you have to name like five or ten things uh, which the people of Guyana or the government of Guyana should do now sure. to implement those good ideas and suggestions that you mentioned in this interview here. Okay, great. That's a very good question. Yes, I do know people in the 
administration, in current administration. In Guyana. In Guyana, okay. and the previous administration, because, you know, I went to school somewhat there and I, I know them. So I have good friends in all, you know, aspect there. In addition, I do have friends in, in Canada too, in the political arena, on the opposition side and the, um, on the liberal side. And in the U.S., I do know some people from the Democrats and some from the Re Republican. So, you know, I do know politicians generally because at the end of the day, you know, the more people you know, the better. And you get an overview because I like to understand, you know, each um, aspect of the political arena. You interact and you yeah. share knowledge. You know. So, yeah, I do know. I do know quite so It's mutually too. beneficial. In I know people in you know, um, other countries too, like Portugal, okay. Spain, right, right. Trinidad. Well, you're an important man. They ought to know you. No, 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 no. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. So, um, to answer your question specifically, I think, you know, everything is going to boil down to money, but the, the, in, the good thing for the natural right. resources industry... Is everything is going to boil down to money. What do you mean? They're going to take money? You have to give them money? No, you have, this is to, to answer your second question, what, how I can assist. Like, okay, they have to pay you? No, no, no. Oh, it's going to boil down to money. Yeah, for capital costs for do stuff. Oh, okay. yeah. I would need investment. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. So they would need money to do stuff. But the, the good thing for the natural resources industry is there's lots of money out there. So they will actually, people will come with money if the conditions and terms are right. You know, there's safety, there's stabi political stability, there's, you know, the so right number, ingredients so, so are So we, we are making a list now of 10 yes, items. Right. Let me write down here. Mm -hmm. uh, one, what is the first one? One. The, the first thing is mm -hmm. to understand that you know, the mining industry is it's a global industry and to be part of the industry. And the key there to answer specifically is to be updated and be up to standard on par. It's going to take some while, but it's to, you know, engage people who are at that level. So you to, want them to acknowledge first yes, of all that the exactly. gold mining Acceptance. industry is important. Yeah. Okay, so natural acknowledge. resources. Acknowledge that gold. No, natural resources. Natural resources is number one yeah. to develop. Okay, we acknowledge that. That's one. The second point. The second point is to ensure ensure what that your protocols, protocols. of communication with foreign investors are very, very efficient. And you should set okay. You know, like communication. A yeah, yeah, a timeline that if you need, if somebody re emails you, must reply. Must reply within a certain time frame. You know, yes. as I'm, I'm, I'm both sides of the fence, as an investor, you, you could tell me no, it doesn't hurt me. But I prefer you telling me no than taking... Okay, second, ensure efficient correspondence. Yeah. Okay, third. Three, have investors come to Ghana. Attract. Foreign investors. Foreign investors. Okay. Four. Prepare and have the small scale miners, which is the local people, mm -hmm. documents to promote their, their projects. So for example, you're a small scale miner. Assist them in preparation. Yeah. Right, so that, what that includes is that you have PowerPoint presentation, show all the, riff, like a PowerPoint presentation, like yeah. how all investment are done. Any documentation on the geology, anything on trends, river, old, mining um, areas, any okay. OMI, where is it relative to OMI? These things help, them, yes. help promote you to the investors. The other thing is Number that five, yes. mm -hmm, to separate small scale and large scale mining. Okay. Because the reason why I'm telling you this, because you have to monitor them and just, you know, you have to be, for a large scale mining company to monitor them, you have to be very, very, um, technologically advanced. So you're going to have to train people for technical um, at the highest level, right. which can be international training, and let them do you know, site visits and see how things are done globally. And for the local guys, you're going to have to have local set of people to look at them. So the other thing is start encouraging. That's number six. Yeah, encouraging and assisting local miners by helping them with drilling. So they don't go mine, buy these massive capital um, intensive things and then realize that they're just mining um, haphazardly. 
But that a, is not going to be like something the government is taking away from the private business? No, the but government starts to get involved in drilling? No, but it's, it's been done in other countries. So what they would do, uh -huh. like what happens right now, if you're a small guy, you would, you would buy whatever mining equipment and go in, into the interiors and start mining. Now, because Guyana is such a small country and because natural resources is one of the major, if not the largest uh, revenue generator, you have to realize that you have to put your efforts there and your priorities there. And by you helping them, in return, the long-term effect is going to actually help the, them back and the country and the people. Because this is what happened. If they drill and they find gold, they can sell you the property and, and recoup the price that they invested. It's going to save you the money now to go on, if you had gone and mined that place that has no gold, and save you time and money and running you bankrupt. Because when, when you start mining, if I tell you that here we find this results, and we spend X amount to drill, you're going to know this part has gold, this doesn't have this, and then you make your decision and you just bid it. It actually helps. It works around the world. That's just to help small miners? Yeah, local <coughs> guys. But wouldn't that be what actually is happening now? I don't that you lend them the money, the banks would lend these people money to buy their machinery and equipment, and if they get gold, they're taking the risk? No, they I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think, I don't think. Banks lend money. To, yeah, banks lend money, right. but banks don't lend money to. To buy equipment? To buy small-scale alluvial mining deposits. Oh, so probably. Because it's high not. risk. It's very high risk. I don't know if you know what's the probability of hitting gold. It's very minimal. Tell our viewers, please. It's, it, they, they say it, it could be like 19 out of 20 people do not make it in mining. So, so that's 5%? Yeah, it's 5% that actually makes, or even less. So it's, it's a very high risk industry, especially how it's done with local miners, which is alluvial mining. Bigger company, it's less risk because you're drilling deep and the probability of the gold being there is much higher. But alluvial, it's, it's, it's a different world altogether. That's what I'm saying, you should separate it. But the key, the, the fundamental thing is that because it's one of the major revenue generator, we have to call on, you know, to assist these guys especially when gold price is lower. Well, why should the government take the risk, take taxpayers' money and risk it into gold mining? Suppose there's no gold. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'll answer that. So that's what I was saying. If there's no gold, then they, they obviously would lose money. If there's gold, it's gonna, so put yourself as a local miner and you take all your, whatever little capital you have, because you have to remember, more than likely the bank's not gonna lend you money. Because the bank, first of all, wouldn't understand how to. But estimate. then you're not a miner; you're just trying to find money, right? Find gold. That, that's most. That's that's what they call themselves local. That's that's the term for small-scale miners or local miners. And you know, different parts of the world is called different things. So if I go there and I get a piece of land, I want to go and dig for gold. I tell the government, "Give me machine and equipment. I'm going to dive." Or dig for gold. Mm -hmm. Isn't that all unfair to the rest of the country? No, that's why they don't normally would do it. That's what I'm saying. But you're recommending that? No, I'm recommending that they assist the local miners by one, like there's a, I think they was going to set up a fund to help drill, help them drill, to do things more scientifically than how it's being done. It's not being, a lot of places not being done this way. It's been done, but it's not being done this way. People take more scientific approach. So you do like, ra you know, you do some random testing, no, random no, no, grinning, random. No? You, you can do it. You see this geological trend. And if you follow the trend, which, which is well known facts, and you do like far spacing, like you don't drill very close and you get an idea what's going on. Instead, you have to understand, this is like a circular thing here. You have a family, you know, you're going to take all your, all your life like savings and go with there. And you're going to start finding. More than like most the small guys doesn't have a technical background in mining or mining engineering or geology. They would go and you know it's a hit or miss situation. <coughs> now if, if, if you miss, your whole family and your family family might be in trouble for forever because you, you take and all don't, their... Don't go into that area if you're right, but, but Go into ideally. Some, do something else. Right, but, the, but this is the effect of um, 
you know, the gold mining, the, the get rich, you know, situation fast. Oh, you want to get rich fast. Anyway, let's go back to our list. We have six points so far. Yeah, so the government Seven. to assist local miners. <coughs> yeah, we have that. Oh, okay. For drilling. For drilling. Okay. Before the that. mining. That's there. number six. Yeah. Um, getting the assistance to take some of these small companies to IPO in Canada. <laughs> How do you do that? Again, so these Canadian companies that mine in Guyana, they all did it. The difference between you and them is that, you know, that they followed all of these guidelines and step and took the company in Toronto and raised money and create mines and have market cap over hundreds of million. So instead of settling, we have to, you know, start gearing our people to understand there's a much bigger picture. So you have picture. to set up a stock exchange probably. Yeah. No, 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 no. To do an IPO in, in okay. Canada. In Canada. Yeah, yeah. So like just like what these Canadian companies do, they would come in and do a partnership with a local guy. And what they would start with first thing, they could start drilling. If you hit one amazing result and you publish it on, on the market, your share price go up. You, you know, you can start raising money. And instead of having all foreigners and stuff coming and do it here, they can, this obviously is going to call for a lot of expertise and assistance to these things. But the thing is, we have to be start gearing there. You want to, for the rest of their life, to have foreign investors coming and invest only? Or do you want to have our own Shield, people? Partnership, like. No, partnership, but yeah, partnership is handy dandy. But it's, isn't it better if you have your own people taking control of, of it and, and, you know, re Cooping all the revenues and you know thing back to the government. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Well, number eight. Yeah, number eight is that you know it's to get out there, get the word out. You, you have to be very proactive. Mining is not mm -hmm. you know everybody knows Guyana. Everybody knows you have to be proactive. You have to attend all the mining conferences worldwide. And very importantly, when you attend, you have to have people who knows mining. Because if you come to an investors and you talk to them and they don't know anything about mining and it's just thing, they look at you very differently because you, know, you have to ensure that you know, you're proactive and have the right people. Nine, mm -hmm. you train and give exposure to the technical, financial, legal, and business staff there because they have to monitor these big companies. And you know you have to know everything because they you can move monies and cash flow models, you can move corporate taxes, you can move royalties, and if you don't understand how they do it, then you can do it. And ten, the the, the most important thing is that we have to you know encourage and start working together to run due diligence on all the companies that are in Ghana, the big big and small company. Because there's a lot of debts that are happening, collapses and stuff like that. And, you know, this calls for more um, tighter regulations, but I'm sure they're in place. We have to have the manpower to do it. So, you know, having infrastructure, developing the interiors will create more jobs and, you know, open up the industry. Open it up. Gan is one of the most on top natural resource company in the world. And, you know, this industry, if properly monitored and managed and regulated, could ensure that all guys live an extremely high standard of living. Very good, uh, Dr. Ramcharan. We are very happy that you have elaborated at least some points here for our viewers to hear. And as you know, this uh, interview will be on YouTube and the Facebook and uh, on our television here. And I think it's very inspiring. And we want to ask you a few more uh, questions before we close this interview. Um, you know, you've achieved a lot and, you know, is there anything you can specifically do to attract foreign direct investment in Guyana? Yeah, I do. I, I know a lot of investors because they always ask me, can they trust my technical and financial inputs? And, you know, being a, a licensed professional, you have to ensure, you, you know, you always on the legal side and try to be conservative. The thing, though, there's a gap. Like, I can bring these people, but I don't want to take them to a, a, a room full of local mining or mining people and, you know, they're not prepared. They don't understand what the people are going to say. They're, they're not prepared to show and understand what these guys have. 
So the, I think the first step is to ensure and prepare these guys before you know making that contact. There's a lot of money in China. There's a lot of money in Europe. And now in the US, a lot of people are moving into private equity and funds into in New York, actually, because they believe there's going to be a boom coming and they want to invest in mining. But I, I cannot, like, you, if you're an investor, you come to me and I tell you, oh, I have a project in X country and sparked here and I think it got five million. Will you invest? <laughs> but if I come to you and I lay out you what I have. Present the paperwork. Present the paper, the due facts. Due diligence and all of right, that. Due diligence. And the thing is, it's never been done. And it's not been done to the level that these investors have been done. So I'm not saying it's something bad or something good, but I'm just saying that you just have to be prepared. You know, and I think that's the first step which should be done. And, you know, it's going to take, we have to understand, you have to accept that, you know, it's never been done. And to get these things done, you have to stretch out. You have to come out, out of your um, comfort zone and reach out to people and ask. It's okay to ask. You know, you have, need to ask for assistance. I remember when, you know, we all in Canada, we all Canadians, and we, you know, mining is led by Canadians. When we were doing that takeover, we had to bring in consultants. We had to relocate upon. And we know that we don't know about these aspects, relocating fishes and ponds and stuff. We bring in consultants because we accept the fact that we do not know. So I think what we have to understand, the next the going forward step is to bring people in and you know, have discussions, help prepare, give examples, show them how things are done, show them things. You know, and gear them up and then have like a massive investment. There's investment um, forums all over the world. The big PDAC was done not a couple of weeks ago in, in March. The yeah. Prime Minister of Canada, ministers from all over the world were there. They have every day like Peru Day, Ecuador Day, where the countries promote their industry and you meet people there that, you know, are tech, who knows the, the industry extremely well from a technical, financial, legal. You know, it's not, you know, and they have countries all over attend there. You have to, you know, get there. So how do you think you can help them to get there? I'm open. I, you know, I, I, can, I can assist them in um, preparation of documents and show them how it's been done, show them, give them examples. I'm willing at my cost to go down and do all of these things too for free. For free, for free. Free is good. Guyana <laughs> likes freeness. And, um, uh, you mentioned the University of Toronto. I'm coming back to that again. I like universities. I've been there for many years of my life. And um, I want to ask you, Dr. Ramcharan, have you made any uh, uh, inroads or developed any relationship with the University of Guyana where uh, you, know, you might be able to better share your knowledge and expertise with the students at the University of Guyana? Oh, yeah, I always like students. I, I really do. And, you know, at University of Toronto, I have some top CEO came in within the first semester, which just finished last week, come in and speak to the students. And it's, it's very nice to know that CEOs and investment committees and stuff like a love student. I don't have a relationship with, I tried a couple times, but things as, you know, the, the communications weren't there. So... Um, you know, did, I'm open. Did, did you write to them? Did you send them emails? No, emails. Did you, yes, no? Emails. Emails, yeah. did they That's, reply to you? You know, in today's technological world, most things are done by email. So yes. I, I did send emails. There I was no replies. Uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't, um, I, I guess maybe they were going through a busy period or, okay. or something. They have excuses happening. for not replying. Okay. Busy period. But I'm willing and happy, you know, to bridge that gap and, you know, maybe have yeah. exchange. Because, you know, I, I'm yeah. in, in the system here. I can you know, have exchange, students come up here and they can go down there and, you know, get a thing well, there. I hope, that, I hope that the people from the Guyana University and the Guyana government would be able to look at this interview and hear your offers and take you up on that. I think yeah. it's a good opportunity to get free service, free... No, it's okay, um, you know. Whatever you want to offer and whatever is valid for Guyana. One more question here before we close our two questions. This is the uh, semi-final question. <laughs> it's the... Uh, you know, you've really uh, made some tremendous achievement of which all Guyanese can be proud. And uh, I want to ask you, you've done so many uh, things in, in your short life. I know you're very young still. What is your next uh, big thing that you have planned 
to achieve in your life? Yeah, that's good. So what I'm thinking about now, you know, I have some good friends in Portugal and Macau and Hong Kong, and we're considering setting up a fund to look for investments around the world in mining. So we're looking to start up a little fund and you know we have good people on the team. We have um, one, the guy from Portugal, he's an international lawyer. We have some good guys in Hong Kong and um, we have a lawyer in Toronto that works with some of the major law firms, a mining lawyer. So I think, um, you know, because we can identify, I've looked at over 400 projects. We can identify good projects and you know whether we coming on, on a placement or we do because there's so many the crowdfunding there's there's so many things to and the world is, is is advancing so fast you know with you know with companies down in Toronto now they have um crowdfunding online so you can do a placement online and then you can maybe trade you know once it um, becomes available you can trade it online instead of doing all of these things on subscription and pen and paper and stuff like that. So the world is moving really fast and to keep up with it, you have to be, you know, think so. So that's, I think, an thing. I'm continue working, obviously. I have, you know, and then lecture part-time and see what I can do. Okay, very nice. And we wish you success in your good endeavors, Dr. Andrew Ramcharan. And we would like to take this opportunity on behalf of the management and staff of ITV to uh, wish you the very best and success in your studies, your continued good work, and in your profession. And hopefully you will get an opportunity to better help not only the Guyanese in the diaspora, but the Guyanese back home in Guyana, and probably the people in the Caribbean especially. Thank you very much, Dr. Rudy. It's, it's indeed an honor and privilege to be here. I'm, I'm very happy you invited me. Because, you know, I, I recognize that the natural resource there is one of the most on top, you know, economic drivers, just, you know. And, you know, looking at Canada, you, you can leverage and benchmark off Canada. You don't need to reinvent anything. You can look at Australia. And, you know, if there's anything I can do to assist you, and I wish you well to in your endeavors and your next step. And if anything I can do to assist, you know where I am. You well, can I contact need to, me. I need a couple gold bars here. Need gold. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Need Andrew Ramcharan, <laughs> we're coming to the end of our interview. And as, we, as is customary on our program in San Guyana, we give our guests the opportunity uh, to probably say what they want to say without any question. I'm not going to ask you a question now. This is your opportunity to look at the viewers in the eyes and tell them your message. What would you like to tell them? Please go right ahead. This is your opportunity. Talk. Okay. Firstly, yeah, I would like to say thanks for, um, before I close. And, you know, just some humble bit of advice. Just for the natural resources industry, just think globally. Think globally and see yourself as a a small village of a bigger, bigger community and think, you know, to, and strive to be at the highest level and understand all different aspects of the industry. Don't settle. I, I see a lot of people try to pigeonhole and settle. Look at the industry, whatever you want to get into, understand the industry and understand all aspects of it. And this is the way forward. So in closing, my only little um, advice is to understand you know the bigger picture always understand the big global picture and see how and where you fit in and strive to be at the highest level always thank you very kindly thank you very much dr andrew ramtran for coming to the program in again it's a pleasure having you sir thank you very much rudy and i look forward to keeping in touch yes we definitely would like to have you again here yeah. thank you kindly you're welcome this is Dr. Rudy Jadapat reporting for the program Inside Guyana, inside the studio at ITV studio here in Long Island City. On behalf of our cameraman Ravi and our producer Prakash and all the members of the staff here at ITV and uh, the management as well, we would like to thank you very much for watching. Until next time, bye-bye.